You're listening to The Broken Meeple Show, a podcast that speaks passionately about board games for the benefit of those who play them. My name's Luke Hector, best known for The Broken Meeple YouTube channel, and I'm an everyday gamer just like you. And I'll be talking about reviews, top tens, and just about anything that connects me to board games, as long as I have a tea or coffee in hand, that is. So grab a cup, relax, and enjoy. And remember, it's only a game. Ooh, hey everyone, how you doing? Oh, a bit tired myself, I must admit. I've uh, literally just had a shower after coming back from the gym. And yeah, finally, I can actually go to the gym now. <laughs> you know, now that, um, uh, te- what's it called, isolation has finished for the UK uh, as of 2nd of December. So we're in tier two where I am at the moment, which means that, you know, interaction is still a bit limited, but the gyms are open so I can still go back for a swim and a gym visit and pretty quiet today. So uh, if, you want, if you're worried that I'm keeping six feet away from people, trust me, I was more than that at pretty much all times while at the gym. So, and everybody disinfects like all the stuff there, myself included, when you use it. So yeah, the risk is still pretty small. But I do I need to get the podcast episode done today. This will probably be the second to last podcast I do for the year. Um, although, uh, will I do another one this month? No, I probably still will. I probably still will do one podcast uh, later this month, but I need to take a break at some stage because work is grinding me to the bone at the moment. We're already like backlogged like crazy and you know things have happened at work that have really caused me anxiety issues. And, you know, on top of trying to get blog stuff out as well, it has been quite painful. And I need to sort of think about my health as well. So I need to consider a break because I've not taken any holiday off since uh, probably like March, April time, probably March when I went to Aircon. Since then, I might have taken a three day weekend to go visit folks. That's about it because there's been no reason to take any holiday because there's been nothing happening. And if we take any holiday, we fall back even further in our work. So it's been quite painful. But I'm taking an extended an extended Christmas break. So from, let's see, I break up on the 18th and then I don't go back until the 4th of Jan. So some of that I'll be in Portsmouth. Some of it I'll be spending home with the folks. I'm allowed to visit them and, you know, so I'm visiting them. Uh, so, you know, look after my mum and dad. And yeah, I, I think what I'll probably do is that I will do... I might do live streams occasionally, like a live play or a QA and a and stuff like that, because I've got to do a December Q&A at some point. But what I will probably do is set a time when I won't produce. I might air them. I might air them at different times, but I will not produce content for maybe like a week and a half over Christmas. So perhaps leading up to just before Christmas Eve, I'll produce stuff because I'll still be in Portsmouth and I'll be off work. But throughout Christmas, throughout that period between like Boxing Day and New Year and probably until at least the 4th of January, I will not be producing content other than potential live streams because live streams don't take up a lot of time. I just have to literally sit down, have fun and talk to people. They're easier to do. But in terms of reviews and top tens and things like that, I've got to say, look, I need a break. I need a chance to reset so I don't hit burnout. So that's likely to happen at some point mid-December, but there's still plenty of content to come before that happens. Firstly, I need to do the top 10 of 2020. That will air before Christmas. Don't worry, I will do that before my break. And I've got three reviews at the moment that are recorded and need editing. I've got one for Kingdom Rush. I've got one for Halito, the new Uri Rosenberg game, and I have just recorded one for Aether Fields. So, you know, I've got three, like, hot reviews that people are wanting to see. I don't know what order I'll do them in. I suspect I'll probably do Aether Fields first, then probably Halito, and then probably Kingdom Rush. But, like I say, it depends which ones I get round to editing. You know, there's no specific order, but I've got a feeling people are going to want to know about Aether Fields first out of those three, and then probably Halito. So, we'll see. That, that is my current order. But of course, I need to do the top 10 of 2020 and a December Q&A as well. So that will happen. But I'm up to date with a lot of other stuff. So, you know, as you can see from the thing here, I've done a couple of E-Raptor related accessorized videos and more on that in a minute. Uh, I've done a Chronicles of Crime review for 1400, the new set. I've done Viscounts of the West Kingdom. That's been very popular at the moment. Thank you, everyone, for viewing that. Uh, Calico, another podcast. Very popular uh, top 10 low complexity, high depth games. Uh, the previous one that I did a couple of years ago got to something like 45, 55,000 views. 
It's currently at 16,000 at the moment, and that's only since it aired on November 21st. So thank you everybody who's seeing that and sharing it around. Very happy with that. And there's been, uh, what else? Um, I did an on, on the Underground solo play, uh, Too Many Bones review, and that's basically... Oh, and some Lizard Den playmats uh, reviews. So that's pretty much what I've done since the last couple of podcasts. And, you know, there's those on the way. But I am going to have to think about what I do in the new year because, again, I don't want to hit burnout. And I think that maybe I'm producing a bit too much content in terms of variety of content. I was even looking at doing things like two-minute overviews of games at one point. But I don't know if I've got the time to do that because I'm doing reviews. I'm doing top tens. I'm doing this podcast. I'm doing the accessorized stuff. I'm doing solo plays, both tabletop and Steam. And that's not including the occasional ad hoc video that I do, like why this left my collection, why this has uh, changed, that sort of thing. It's just getting quite a bit. So I need to determine which series are working, which ones are kind of like not really hitting the mark in terms of views for effort and just what, you know, frequency I got to do stuff. I mean, I can't really keep to a schedule. It's very difficult to do that, uh, particularly when games are either not coming out or they're coming out in droves. So I try to do a video every Wednesday and every weekend at minimum, but then I'm doing more stuff on top of that, and I try to do a podcast every two weeks Sunday, which so far is working, but it's, it's hard to keep up with it all. So what I'm probably going to do is, I mean, obviously reviews and top tens are still happening, and I do like doing solo plays. I'm, I don't have the setup for a good solo play studio, unfortunately, because in the UK we live in tiny houses, and there's not enough room in here to get a lot of equipment. So... Well, I'll probably still do the tabletop solo plays because even though they don't get a ton of views, people still enjoy them. And to be honest, I get to play a game, so I have fun. I'll definitely do the Steam app ones because I just sit in front of my PC and talk. They'll probably be live streamed as opposed to the other ones which are recorded. Again, live streams easier to do. But I have a feeling I'm probably going to stop doing the accessorized videos because they still take a bit of effort. I've got to build whatever the accessories are. I've got to talk about them. I've got to use a weird setup camera wise for them. And they just don't generate a lot of views. I mean, some people watch them, but they just don't generate for the effort that it takes to make them. It's not worth putting myself out for that. I'd rather spend that time doing more top tens, doing more reviews, that kind of thing, or even just the other ad hoc content. Certainly, I would like to spend more time on top tens because people want to see those. I mean, I've done the top 10 ticket to ride maps. That was good. I did the top 10 complexity ones, like I said, and that was really popular. So I want to do more top tens. And I will also want to do more live streams because I've managed to get StreamYard working to the point where I'm... 80% comfortable with it you know I've got to make some video transitions and stuff like that but I tested it on the last Q&A and it seemed to work quite well then um, by all means give me some feedback on that but I'm gonna do collaborations with other content creators now so Board Game Ramblings and I have already discussed doing a top 10 together uh, top 10 games the other channel is wrong about or something you know like a ton in cheek list and because, you know, we love each, you know, we get on well, we're perfectly good mates and we do have games that we do like, but we have plenty of games that we don't like from each other. So, you know, we're just going to have a nice fun ton in cheek list where basically each channel rags on the other. But that will probably happen in January. We're looking to do that soon. Would have liked to have done it before Christmas, but they're a bit booked up for December, understandably. So probably in January, we will do that a live dual stream of top 10 games on that one and I want to do with other channels as well I mean you know I I do shout outs to a lot of channels I'd like to have them on to do top 10 lists you know different top 10 lists or different topic discussions and I think that would be good fun to do and get me to use StreamYard more often and get more comfortable with it because so far it has definitely it was worth it on that q and I want to use it more often and I think it's going to be worth the whole the effort that the Patreons did in order to get me to that stage so we shall see how things go on that front. So what is the purpose of this podcast? Well, Board Game Geek, as you can see, isn't working. <laughs> Board Game Geek is actually dead today. So you're not going to see a lot of images if you're on the deluxe form of this podcast on YouTube. So I do apologize for that. But I just wanted to quickly go over a bunch of games that I recently sold. Um, Board Game Co. Do, uh, do this video every now and again for games that have left the collection. I do the occasional video of why this has left the collection, why this has changed rating. But I did such a big cull of games recently, and not all of these have sold in this picture. Uh, there's quite a few there that I'm still waiting to sell, uh, but a lot of them have shifted. 
And I just want to go over briefly on each game why they're shifting. You know, why am I getting rid of them? So, but my collection is at a point now where it's one in, one out. So, you know, if I can't fit it on the shelf, something's got to go. So it's now like, right, I've got to really think about the games I want to keep. But some of them will go because of logistical problems. Like, oh, I'm never going to get this to the table. It's too big. It's too bulky. With the one exception that the stuff that's in my crates above, I can't really sell because they're no longer in their original boxes. They are basically permanently in the collection, whether I like it or not. You know, the only way they will leave the collection is if I physically chuck them away. And I don't really want to do that unless I sell the crate. But that means somebody locally is going to have to buy it. And the likelihood of that is pretty low. But I'm not, I'm not opposed to the, uh, the, the opportunity should it arise. But logistical issues will get in the way. But primarily it's just rating. So my collection was at a point where I was keeping games that were 6 and 7. Then it was just 7s. Now it's getting to the point where as I add new games in, I've got to get rid of games that I rate a 7. And that's good. That's a good rating for me. In fact, I've still got to do a video on uh, explaining my rating system. Might do that before Christmas, actually. It's a fun video. But the you know everything on my shelf here is predominantly eight and above. But there are still a few sevens, whether because they're good gateway games or you know stuff like that. And that might mean that I'll keep the game. You know, it's like oh, I don't get it to the table very much, but I know that if I meet someone who wants to learn about games, good. I've got some easy stuff I can show them. But yeah, there's a few here that have gone. Some of these were ones that I bought purely to review them and then didn't keep them. And some of them I, I've had for a little bit and just decided now's the time to leave. Perhaps my board game cafe, Dice, has already got them. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm good. Maybe friends of mine own them and I'm happy with. Or maybe in the case of one there which hasn't sold yet, uh, Fantasy Brawl, it's a Kickstarter project that I backed and kind of thought, yeah, I'm not really going to be able to store this. I don't think this is going to get played very much and decided to let it move on. I mean, that is the only reason Fantasy Brawl is shifting. Purely because it's not practical to, for me to keep it. I don't think it will get played. I still think it's a good game, but I think somebody else would benefit from having it rather than me. But uh, let's just go over a few of these at the moment. So, I mean, those of you listening obviously can't see the whole lot, but uh, others of you can. And like I say, I would have liked to have shown you more pictures of these, but short of going to some uh, like publisher websites and showing off a few pictures, there's not a lot I can really do about that because <laughs> in Board Game Geek Down, I need to get this uh, podcast out and it would just take me far too long to go to various you know, publisher websites and that. But let's just start off with, let's say, and I'm also not going to talk about ones that I've done reviews on. So uh, Too Many Bones is on there. I've already done a review of that one. Go check out that video. Uh, but I've done a review of... Let's see, which ones have I... Well, to be fair, actually, I've reviewed quite a few, so maybe that's unfair, but... Oh, I'll just do what I can. So, Paris is there. Paris, I'm selling that one off. I bought it. People were saying, oh, this is a pretty cool, like, lightweight game. I'll... It's a Euro game through and through, but this is nice and light and yet got a bit of depth. We'll go with it. So I thought, all right, I'll buy it. I found a copy of it somewhere, and I thought I'd try it. And it was average. Pretty much just average, really. Meh, above average, maybe, but it... It just didn't really wow me. It's like, okay, so I'm just putting buildings out and then I'm paying money to put a key on a building, which then gives me a little bonus around this track. And then I do it again and then do it again. And the way to win is to get the landmarks because they're the most powerful thing there. It just felt very linear and it didn't really have any theme or anything to kind of engage me in. It wasn't bad. It's smooth, it's light, and it's very easy to learn and play. But, you know... Paris theme meant nothing. There was no point to it. And I didn't really just get enough out of it. Not enough to want to keep anyway. Bear in mind, these have got to be, what, like, rating eight plus games for me to want to keep them in the collection now. That's uh, a tall order, for, especially for a lot of stuff I bought in 2020, but in that way. Ah, some decaf tea there for you. Right. Too Many Bones. I've done a review on that recently, so I'm not going to belabor that too much. But basically, Too Many Bones has got the problem of having too many rules or too many rules issues. Learning this game is an absolute pain. The rulebook is not very good. You have to FAQ a ton, rule reference it a lot. It's still, it's very well produced. I mean, I'll give it that. And it is fun to have all the different dice and the replay value is really, really good in terms of the characters. But there's no story narrative in this. I mean, the fact that they call it an RPG is kind of misleading, really. I don't feel like I'm playing my role. I just feel like my character's got some cool abilities. The story's non-existent. The encounters all feel the same, really. It's punishingly difficult. 
it just didn't really sell me. I mean, I, I get why people would like it or like like it more than I do and think it's that. But when people say this is like, oh, this is the best solo game ever, I'm sorry. I can think of a lot of better options. Tank Garden, I like it, but it's got one problem that constantly keeps resurfacing um, and it's put me off enough that I want to sell the game. And I think I have sold this one, actually. Yeah, this one has sold. I'll let you know if I haven't sold it out of this picture, but Tang Garden is from Thundergriff Games, and it's a good game. You know, you, you are building this very picturesque garden landscape with bridges and, you know, trees and flowers and lakes and stuff. And then you've got the walls that you set around the edge of the garden where you've got the viewpoints that look really good. I mean, the artwork in this, the production quality is stellar. And I normally would want to keep this sort of game because this is like, oh, a nice, charming, fun game. One big problem, though, the eyesight that you need in order to do this game well is a bit extensive. It's everything like iconography wise is so small. Some of it is faded on the tiles, which doesn't help. But the ones on the wall, you're supposed to like, you get points for certain characters facing certain walls based on the symbols. The symbols are so tiny that it just causes problems for people. Unless you've got a very small table that you're playing this on, people are going to struggle to see those icons. And every game it came up where someone struggled to see it. Even I struggled to see it at a point. And now my eyesight's pretty good. So it just thought, oh, as much as this game is good, the fact that people are struggling with it because its graphic design needs some work, and even the rulebook was not fantastic, you know, it just, it meant that, yeah, you know what, for a big game of this size, it wasn't practical to bring it out as much. And like I say, size of a game is another factor. I mean, I mentioned Super Fantasy Brawl. Look at the size of that box. It's huge. Where am I supposed to put it? <laughs> um... Alma Mater, I did a review of this one. I like it fine. Um, I can't remember what I gave it. I might have given it a 7. Did I give it a 7 out of 10? I can't remember. But I think this is one of the 7s that I thought, yeah, you know what? It's probably not going to get played because it's a fairly heavyish game. It's got kind of limited paths to victory I found in it. I There were one or two things that I wasn't a fan of uh, with the game itself, which didn't put me off at first. But when I'm trying to think what I'm going to keep in the collection... It's got a lot of similarities to Coimbra, and I prefer Coimbra. Coimbra for me is a 7 out of 10 as well, so I mean, you know, that's got to watch itself. But I played Coimbra recently, and I felt, yeah, you know what? Coimbra is better than Alma Mater, and if I'm p picking a game that's similar weight to Alma Mater, I think I'd pick other heavier games that I can find. So it didn't have enough theme with the whole university thing, which was a bit of a letdown. It's wonderfully produced. I mean, the artwork's nice and colourful. It's a very unique style and those books those plastic books are gorgeous they are so good but i just found it was a bit limited in replay value and scope and the whole idea of charging us a ton of money for a tiny little mini expansion with a few extra students not good enough not good enough uh trismegistus trismegistus yes this is a good game and i think i rated it an eight originally i think it's now probably a seven for me but the problem for this is just practicality it is such a complex game and the rule book is pretty atrocious as well. So once I've forgotten the rules to it and I've forgotten half of the rules to it, learning this is a chore, an absolute chore. The solo mode didn't win me over either because it's too easy. I can be an absolute novice at that game and still beat the solo on a normal difficulty. You've got to add a lot of modifiers for the AI to be worth their salt. And But even then, I've still got to learn a ton of rules. It's just... The game is overly fiddly and complex, despite the fact, even though it's a heavy game. But there are heavier games, there are heavy games I've played where it's nowhere near as fiddly or as like, oh my god, rulebook atrocious and that. And it's just like, if I'm going to pick anything from board and dice, I'm going to be picking Tale to Huacan. I'm going to be picking Tekenu. I'm probably, well, I haven't yet played, well, I've played one game of it. I need to play more of it. Uh, the Taiwan, Taiwan Tinsu or something. I forget his name, but the new one that's out. I'd probably rather play those three than Trismegistus. So Trismegistus had to be the one to go. Uh, that one hasn't sold yet, actually. Uh, no, that one hasn't sold yet. Nor is this one, Manhattan. Manhattan ha Manhattan's a good gateway game. You're putting buildings on, on the board. And actually, let's see if the Board Game Geek has started working nope still busted <laughs> apologies but um manhattan is a light gateway game you play cards in order to place these translucent buildings on the various city quadrants shall we say well, quadrants 
sectors there's multiple of them i think there's like six to eight different cities you can build in and the idea is, is that you're trying to get the tallest cities in each but people are building on top of your stuff and they're nicking your spots and that it's pretty cutthroat but it's very straightforward you're pretty much just playing cards and punking buildings down it's very good gateway game but it's a seven out of ten for me and uh, my local cafe has a copy of it I don't find myself bringing it out over other gateway games that I would rather play than Manhattan because having a game that's pretty mean is not necessarily good for a gateway game, I feel, because new players don't want to feel like they're getting screwed over on a regular basis. So I kind of thought Manhattan had to go, but that one hasn't sold yet. And nor has this next one, which is kind of a kind of weird, actually. I thought it would sell by now. Quick cup of tea. And that is uh, Reckholt. Reckholt? Is that how you pronounce it? Reckholt? Uh, this is the Uri Rosenberg game from Renegade Games. And it's essentially a lightweight farming game where you're growing vegetables in greenhouses in order to feed the tourists. It's technically a race game, but racing quotes. You can basically just call it victory points because it's basically whoever gets furthest still on the track at the end of the game wins. It could be a VP track. It really doesn't make a difference. But the idea is, is that you grow the vegetables in your greenhouses and there's restrictions in different sizes. It's worker placement, so very light worker placement. Get the greenhouse, get the veg, grow it, get stuff in the market, maybe trash a greenhouse or two to somehow feed the tourists. Don't ask me how that works, thematically. But it's very easy to play, uh, but it's got a lot of depth in that you need to plan ahead for what vegetables you need. You get one free movement, which you can save for the time when it's like, oh, I don't have any carrots. All right, fine. I'm going to use the free movement on there, but I better make certain I've got free tomatoes, free cabbage, free mushrooms. Can I get free, uh, what's the other one they got? Uh, cabbage, mushroom, lettuce, tomatoes, another veg. Oh, there's another veg. Oh, cauliflower. But uh, yeah, there's cauliflower as well. It's like, can I get free cauliflower before the end of this round? And it's like, it's only a few rounds of play and it's neat. The solo mode's kind of bland and, you know, not particularly interesting. But the multiplayer is decent fun. Two to four players is fine. It can outstay its welcome a bit with four though. And I do like the cards that you have, which get you special abilities that you can share with your neighbors. But there's only so many of them and you don't use enough of them in a game for my liking. So the game is fine, it's just it's a 7 out of 10, and I needed room on that particular shelf to fit Viscounts of the West Kingdom, because effectively Renegade Games and Garpil Games share the same Calyx shelf, and with Search for Planet X on there, as well as Viscounts of the West Kingdom, I felt, am I bringing Red Holt out enough? I mean, I, I have played it quite a bit in its time, I've usually been the, the poster, the, not the poster child, uh, the one shouting it about it, saying, look, this is an underrated game, and I still think it's underrated. But is it going to stay in my collection? Who knows? But no one's bought it yet. Okay. Okay, we're on the throat. Alubari. I think I did a review. Did I do a review of Alubari? I don't think I did. Oh, wait, I did a podcast. Yes, I spoke about it on a podcast. Which podcast was that then? Uh, that must be the review anthology one, I guess. Let's have a look. Uh, I can see Search for Planet X. I can see Arkham Horror. I can see Truffle Shuffle and Paris. So I did that on a review anthology. I could have sworn I did Alibari. I got a feeling maybe it was on a previous episode because I do review sort of random games every now and again. Uh, Into the Oniverse. Into the Oniverse. Maybe that was it. Is that it? Can't see it. Nope. That's not it. Come on. I, I'm going to find it. I know I have done a brief review of this. It must have been the podcast before. Do, 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 talk amongst yourselves. Oh, yeah. Ah, this could be it. Uh, House Rules, yay or nay? Episode 11? Nope, that's Lord of the Rings Shadow Expansion and Stockpile. Come on, I know I have talked about it, and I will find the answer before this podcast is over. I will do so. <laughs> as God is my witness. Come on, is that the one? LCG warnings? Probably not. I can't have been that far behind, surely. Ah, here it is. We found it. It was the first review anthology, funny enough. I did What's Missing, uh, Splendor Marvel, and Alabari. And this was the episode nine of the podcast. So go check that one out. Anyway, back to the plot. Um, Alabari is basically like a sequel sister to uh, Snowdonia. Snowdonia is fine. You've got different weather effects. It's worker placement. You're building a railroad around to, to Snowdonia. Boring theme, but whatever. 
quite a mean game for my liking in terms of blocking people, but it's a, you know, it's a half decent game. It's just not one that I would keep. This one I thought was a bit better than Snowdonia because the rules felt a bit more condensed. It felt like a streamlined version of Snowdonia, but it's still got a lot of depth. I mean, there's still plenty enough you got to do in this game and a lot of card combos that you can pull off. It still uses the weather system and you're growing tea and using tea leaves and that. I thought this was a solid enough game, but kind of like a 7 out of 10. Do I want to play it often? I've played it. It says 60 to 90 minutes on the box. Trust me, it is not a 60 to 90 minute game. Add at least another 30 minutes to that. And it can go pretty long with the max players. Oh, so, yes, because people AP on this like crazy. And I didn't really care about the solo mode too much. I mean, it was okay, but I wasn't that fussed. So it's it's one that if no one had bought it, I might have kept it. But that one has gone. But I would happily still play it. I still think it's a pretty good game. And that's something I should preface about all of these, actually. I don't think any of these are bad games, with the possible exception of... Well, no, no, none of them are bad games, but Paris was kind of average for me. All right, Shuffle Shuffle. I think I talked about that in the last podcast episode. It's a neat little game, card drafting. You're collecting different chocolates of different colors and suits in order to fulfill orders, which is a bit like doing poker hands. You grab points, you do it for three rounds, rinse, repeat, see who has the most. Really straightforward, and it's looked it's a really stay in the collection i mean uh the same people who did this i think did point salad which is down there uh, yeah they did point salad and i think this is a better filler game than truffle shuffle so only room for one i'm afraid nautilion uh, nautilion uh, right now a lot of people have asked me have you got the correct number of markers in the box i have checked there is the correct number of markers in the box but this one didn't wow me as much as the other Oniverse games. I mean, I've got Sylvian, Onirim, and Aerion, which are my three favorite. Nautilion was the one that kind of escaped me, and I thought, you know, maybe this will be good, but it's a roll and move game. Am I going to enjoy a roll and move game? In this instance, not so much. The game is just punishingly hard, and it's roll and move, which means you don't really have much control over the dice. Aerion is technically Yahtzee, but you have... Fair, um, fair amount of ways to mitigate those dice rolls and you've got multiple things to aim for here you're literally moving your ship the opponent's ship and putting a die on some random monument thing that screws you over as well and it's just like well i could roll there's not many numbers that you roll it's not one to six it's like one to three i think one to four and you know as you roll you don't get a lot of options but you're supposed to somehow pick up a ton of these crew before they get to your island so you've got to pick up all these crew get to the opponent's island before it gets to your island while also not losing everything to this monument it's a pretty tall order i don't even think i've won this game yet it just it just seemed a bit too punishing for how random it was i can understand that some people would like it. I mean, it's an easy rule set it was very easy to play it still has the nice funky look of the universe games but ah, i've got three of them i'm comfortable with that Nautilion just isn't for me, although that one has not sold. Nor is Truffle Shuffle yet. I have a feeling that both of them will probably see uh, Dice Cafe if they don't sell, because I think both of them, well, Nautilion maybe, well, I'm not desperate, but Truffle Shuffle I think would do very nicely in the Dice Cafe if no one wants it. All right. Small World of Warcraft. It's a decent game. Small World is fine, but I've kind of just burnt out a bit on Small World. It's it's still a good game. I mean, I gave it a good rating. Uh, did I give it a 7 or 8? I can't remember. But the thing is, is that I don't find myself playing Small World that often um, in favor of other gateway games. And I, you know, there's a bit of a nostalgic collection for me for the World of Warcraft theme, but not enough for me to sort of want to keep it. I don't tend to bring it out that often. And I thought, well, the Dice Cafe's got Small World anyway. In fact, they might even have the World of Warcraft version. And I just thought, if I want to play Small World, somebody else will have it or it will be in a game library somewhere. And I just didn't feel like I needed to keep it. Because the whole idea of combining the different races with different effects does put off people as a gateway game, especially when you've got a hand on a giant reference sheet. So I sort of think of it as a next step up. And it was taking up space there, which uh, is kind of a mix of... Because I've got... Tainted Grail down there, and I've got this War of Mine here, and I try to keep publishers together, but I'm struggling to do that at the moment. But uh, I wanted to keep Portal uh, sort of in one area. Uh, let's see, Days of Wonders there, AEG is there, there, and there, so it's kind of a bit haphazard. 
And then Fantasy Flight has uh, invaded an extra shelf because Lord of the Rings has had an extra box. Uh, that's the and uh, Arkham Horror just had the Underdark Waves. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it actually. Can you see that shelf in the view? Yes, you can. Um, I've just had the Under Dark Waves expansion for this delivered, and you know that extra content means I need two boxes to store my Arkham Horror Third Edition. So, yeah, it's kind of um starting to migrate a little bit over. And Small World of Warcraft was taking up space. Potion explosion. The game is still fine. I had an expansion. I even had the plastic dispenser in it actually, but I just don't find myself playing it very much. It's it takes too long for what it is at times, as people AP like crazy over the marbles. And it's cool to have that tactile dispenser and the marbles, but the app is so much better. You can play it on Board Game Arena, you can play it on an app, and it's so much faster. It takes out the upkeep, it takes out the fiddliness, but you've still got that level of depth. This is one of those occasions where the app has just kind of killed the game for me, and I will play it. I'll happily play it if you cap it at free players, but uh, yeah, it just hasn't stood the test of time. But it's still a good game. Still a good game. And... In terms of that one and... What's the other one? Uh, oh, what's it called? Gears something? No, what's the... I'm trying to think. Come on, Board Game Geek, work. Ooh, did it be working? Nope, still busted. There was the other one. It was called Gears or Grinds or something. Uh, gizmos. Gizmos, yes, that's it, Gizmos. Uh, that one is similar to Potion Explosion. I prefer Potion Explosion, but both of them are similar games as well. I don't own either, anyway. Survive, Escape from Atlantis. It's got the mini expansions in it, the giant squid, the dolphin and all that. It can do six players. It's a fun game. I bought it mainly for nostalgia purposes though, and it is well produced and it is a nice game. I mean, Escape from Atlantis, if you want a mean in your face game, then great. My problem with it is that A, doesn't hit the table very often. It's a seven out of 10 for me, so ratings brought it down. But also, I don't like playing it with my friends because my friends basically just go after me all the time in it. And I know, yeah, it's only a game, but I want to actually have a chance in the game. And if everybody gangs up on you, then because they think it's funny, then it's not fun for that other person. And it's no point in playing because there's no chance you have to win. So it's kind of like above the level of meanness that I'm comfortable with now. I liked it as a kid. I still think this is a fun game if you're into that sort of thing. But uh, nah, it's left a collection. And that one did sell. So did Potion. So did Small World. Fact. Apart from Fantasy Brawl on this photo, the next lot have sold as well. So, two more. Like I said, I already mentioned Super Fantasy Brawl. So, there's two more now before I wrap this podcast up. Uh, Lowlands. Lowlands. This was an Uwe Rosenberg game. Well, no, actually, no. It's not Uwe Rosenberg. It's two different designers. But it was inspired. It was it was partially developed, like, like overseen by Uwe Rosenberg. So, it's not one of his games. But you can definitely see his influence here. But... This was an interesting game where you had to do sheep farming. So build your paddocks and collect sheep. Okay, that's pretty cool. But you were also building up this dam in order to stop the impending flood. So, and you built this dam up as a group. So you had your own individual sheep farm, but the dam was built by the players. And depending on who put the most effort into it, they might get more points at the end, but then everybody needs to put in some effort. Otherwise it will overflow destroy some of their sheep farms and that and it's kind of like well how many of me care whether the sheep farms go down or not it was an interesting dynamic and i thought it was quite neat but it does have a fair few rules for what's in it the dike itself is a little fiddly to manipulate even though you know you had some pretty good components for it and i just thought yeah as fun as it is it's a 7 out of 10 for me and i've got caverner i've got fields of Arl. i'm kind of good and feast of odin i suppose you could consider although that's a bit different but I'm kind of catered for farming games, and uh, you'll you'll find out a bit more about what I think of Halito when I do that review. Ishtar, last but not least, Ishtar, Bruno Cathala game, light gateway level or gateway plus, I guess. It's still it's very nice. It's well produced. You're you're building garden tiles on this kind of desert map, surrounding fountains, area control. You've got a few abilities you can unlock. It's nice. It's just a little bit linear. Like, the game's kind of progress in the same way, the whole movement thing around with, like, oh, I can move my thing so far. It didn't really have much of an impact on the game, you know, it didn't really change people's method of playing, and sometimes you could get screwed over by what tile you were left with. But it was, it was fine. I gave it, I think, a 7 out of... Did I give it an 8? I'm not sure. I think it's probably a 7 out of 10 now after multiple plays. 
But it's one of those things where I think Bruno Kefala has done a ton of great games, you know, ton of great games, a lot of them in my collection. But this one is kind of like, it's good, just not great. And if I'm going to bring out something lightweight from Bruno Kefala, I can think of a lot of other games I'd rather bring out. Even just the original Abyss would be pretty sweet. So, you know, it's just, it's just one of those games that didn't quite stay in the collection. And like I say, all of these are good games, just not collection worthy. It's like, collection worthy is minimum 8 out of 10, unless there's a mitigating reason why not. I mean, at this point, it's not that I'm going to get rid of all the games in my collection that are 7 out of 10 at the moment, but I'm certainly going to consider them first for the culls if I need to move something. So it's just a case that if you are a 7 out of 10, you're in danger of getting culled. So yeah, that's all of them. That mini troll, and like I say, Manhattan, Trismegistus, Raycult, Truffle Shuffle, Nautilian, and Fantasy Brawl have still yet to actually sell. Um, I'm only selling to UK people, but you know, I'll probably have to put another Facebook post up again to sell the rest of these off. But the rest of them have gone, hopefully to owners who get a kick out of them. You know, I mean, obviously if you wanted it, you obviously had an interest in it. And I hope that those of you who did buy those games are enjoying them and having a good time with them you know because one man's uh one man's trash is another man's treasure and in this case they weren't trash they were decent enough games but maybe they are the bee's knees for those of you who bought them so yeah that's pretty sweet and we're up to what are we at to we're up to 36 minutes for this podcast and the battery's about to run out because i didn't plug it in so with my voice going i think i'll wrap this one up actually i'll try and think of a a year in review shall we say perhaps for the next podcast episode but as I say, Kingdom Rush review, Halato review, Aoife Fields review, <laughs> top 10 games of 2020. That is definitely happening. So, you know, yeah, I'll do a year in review podcast episode in two weeks. So, you know, I won't talk about my best games for the year. I might talk about my most disappointing games or uh, best expansions or best experiences or best video games I've played. You know, I might do that. Would, I do, would something like that be better live? No, I'll just mention things like that in life. Now, I'll try and do that in the next podcast episode for you. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap up and make some uh, curry dinner before Stellaris night tonight. So, take care. I hope you're enjoying yourselves for what remains of the December period up until we go home for Christmas. Uh, you will hear from me before Christmas, so don't worry. Uh, just take care. As I say, think of your health. If you're a content creator, make certain you take a break. If you are hard at work, make certain you know how to like, enjoy your social time and that, you know, despite COVID and that, just trying to, you got to keep your work-life balance up and just really do anything, exercise, uh, you know, cook, relax, anything. Just find something that helps you relax and do it because you do need to think about your health, particularly in this day and age. So yeah, I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. I'll uh, chat to you later on the next Broken Meeple podcast. Take care, everybody. Love you all loads. And remember, it's only a game. Take care.